Hello and welcome to the latest edition of the Cotillia School of Public Policy's Let's Talk Policy series. I'm Nidhi Razdan. Today is World Environment Day and we are focusing, of course, on the critical issue of climate change. Now this year, the theme is ecosystem restoration. The United Nations has said that the world must deliver on its commitment to restore at least 1 billion degraded hectares of land in the next decade in order to tackle the climate crisis and save species from extinction and secure our future. Now, for nearly two years now, we've also been living with the reality and the horrors of the pandemic, which has completely disrupted our normal lives. And perhaps more than ever, experts believe that the time has come to focus on climate change front and center now more than ever. It gives me great pleasure to introduce our terrific panel this evening. We have Dia Mirza, who's of course an actor, producer, and goodwill ambassador of the United Nations Environment Program. Dia, thanks so much for being with us today. We have Arun Krishnamurti joining us. He's the founder of the Environmentalist Foundation of India and has been doing some terrific work uh, is as far as saving our, our water bodies and lakes uh, are concerned. So we're going to talk to Arun Krishnamurti about that. And joining us uh, shortly will be Bharti Chaturvedi, the founder and director of the Chintan Environment Research and Action Group. We already have questions coming in uh, from our students and uh, other members who've logged in. Uh, Dia, let me ask you this question first. What are the lessons you think that the pandemic has taught us uh, about climate change and about our environment? If you were to just look back on the last year and a half or so. I want to start with saying thank you for having me, Nithi. I'm very grateful to um, be a part of this because I do believe in the power of engagement and, uh, and, and, and the fact that engagement has risen. It's been higher in the past year and a half than perhaps ever before. And uh, I would like to believe that this is a direct outcome of um, just the individual personal realizations people have had by being locked in and looking out and witnessing blue skies, witnessing and breathing cleaner air, hearing bird song, watching uh, nature and animals and biodiversity reclaim spaces that we had crowded and polluted and populated with human activity and noise. Um, I think that one of the biggest lessons that uh, I hope actually, I don't think I hope we've learned is the uh, fact that we are not separate from nature and that the health of the environment and the health of the planet is direct, directly connected to human health. If we are to believe the theory that this is a zoonotic disease and caused by whether it is the wet markets or trafficking of wildlife or degradation of forest and forest lands um, and the interaction of human beings with wild animals that we have no business having any kind of interaction with uh, that has led to this devastating uh, period in human history, um, then perhaps we would also learn or be encouraged to understand the importance and the relevance of uh, just allowing nature to be and of course restoring and securing all the natural environments that we need for every security of our existence, uh, be it food security or health or um, everything that we need really for our survival, water, air, just about everything. Quite, quite a number of lessons actually uh, that you've drawn from from this experience of the with the pandemic. Uh, I, I just wanted to ask Arun Krishnamurti his thoughts on that as well, and because in fact Arun, uh, you know, a lot of experts initially had hoped that with the lack of travel and you know factories closing down etc that some of the effects of climate change might have been mitigated uh, in in many parts of the world because you had these big lockdowns but now they're saying that that's really not the case it's just you know not been enough and and we need to you know pay attention to this issue uh, what according to you are the lessons uh, from from the pandemic for us as far as the environment is concerned mine again is hope as an extension to my fellow panelists mentioned simply because I'm not too sure if you've learned the lesson this quick and even during this uh, difficult time. I'll tell you why. When the first wave of the pandemic struck, it was new to us and we were being introduced to a whole new world, a whole new concept of surviving a wave of a virus infection. 
when the second wave struck is when we realized how much of our money or whatever the contacts be they were not going to be hospital beds and uh, networks and contacts is not what's going to help us survive what is my planetary skills can i grow my own vegetables without a motorized pump would i know how to draw fresh drinking water what are my survival skills on this planet even when there's a lockdown that's been declared or a large urban mindset which i'm not blaming anybody i i'm including me in that list was to hoard what was to just go procure everything that's possible under the sun so that i could be at home in the comfort of home still consume at the same level at which i was consuming pre pandemic when i had access to outdoors i was now in the comfort of home binge watching still had access to everything that i needed that's how i think we're grooming ourselves more than looking at why did this disease happen in the first place keeping aside political reasons right why didn't the natural way did this disease happen and how fit am i how fit am i mentally physically and with regards to the planet at large when we when we clean lakes and ponds i'll just give you this sort of personal experience when we clean lakes and ponds it's more like a dirty supermarket you'll find everything from a diaper to contraceptives to medicines to certificates to wedding photographs and uh, all of this all of this would be there in that lake and a pond today i'm finding gloves no masks and so my my bigger question is have we learned anything and we always we too much of a government dependent society which irks me whoever is in power we too much of a government dependent society where we want the government of the state of the city of the federal setup to do everything for us we don't take a minute to think back as to what is my future and that is where i think the change is happening in a select set of population who who feel themselves to be who consider themselves to be lucky to still be alive because i am one of them in close circles we have lost many people and i have i have asked myself questions about my own lungs my own liver my own kidney what i'm eating local produce my impact on the planet shampoo soap to detergents to what am i sending out as exhaust i have the time i'm thinking more about all of this and i hope many students who are part of this uh, discussion today are also thinking on those lines and we're able to take this in a vernacular to the larger wider population that's a very good point and in fact i wanted to talk to you about what more people can do because you run such a terrific volunteer organization that's been doing so much and so how do we encourage people to look beyond the state and you know be involved in 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 daily change themselves so let's talk about that just a little later bharti chaturvedi also uh, with us uh, this evening bharti thanks so much for being with us just wanted your thoughts i mean what have you learned over the last year year and a half of lockdown no lockdown uh, and and the impact it's had on our environment i i hope bharti can hear us you'd have to unmute your mic thank you uh, well there's a lot we learned but i think the biggest thing that we we must have the for right uh, unfortunately bharti we're not able to hear you uh very clearly so i think we'd, we'd have to reconnect uh, your device and only one device please uh so we'll come back to you a little later let me go back to dia then uh you know the point that uh, arun raised which was very valid was that you know we are a, a society that sort of expects the government to do everything for us how do we uh, if you were to tell people okay what are the little things that we can do in our daily lives to uh, to contribute to saving the climate to saving the planet i i think a lot of people just sort of roll their eyes and say okay what difference will it make if i re- whether i recycle or i don't but i think what people don't realize is that every little effort counts and and adds up to something so if you were to list a few things the uh, that that people could just practice in their daily lives what would those be there are many things but i think i'd start with 10 that come to the top of my mind please uh, do there are many platforms available and accessible to young people um that you can connect on and and discover many more action points but uh, some of the things that i have managed to do uh, in in my everyday life are the following uh one is to practice a mostly plant based diet it has a huge huge positive impact on the environment uh and not just plant based uh i would also include local food unpackaged food and seasonal food and fruit 
Um, the second would be to uh, refuse single use plastics, carry your own mug, carry your own bag, uh, refuse even surgical masks and single use uh, plastic gloves. There's a lot of debate and I'm bringing this up as a part of single use plastics because Arun mentioned what he did. And this is something that is deeply concerning me as well because we just don't manage our waste well. And if we can't be responsible for the single use plastic we're generating, we have no right to use it. So uh, identify those items of single use that we can easily do away with. Of course, not the at the cost of health and hygiene, but everything that we can, we must. The third would be uh, to simple actions, you know, things that you learned in school that you forget as you grow up, turn off the lights, turn off uh, the means of, uh, you know, appliances when, when not in use. Um, the other thing that I think we can all do, and it takes some effort, but once it's done, feels like a really, really uh, wonderful achievement is to manage our waste better. So segregate and compost at home, refuse uh, to kind of, you know, just burden your civic body with mixed waste. And if you can find access to where you can deposit your e-waste and your paper waste and your other items of waste, which I think uh, many cities now have uh, collection centers and it just takes a little bit of effort to find them and, and you can use them effectively. Um, fashion is something that we talk a lot about, you know, people love clothes, people love things. So I would say that identify items of consumption that are uh, kind on the environment and are respectful of the environment. So um, try zero waste fashion, try uh, to consume less and waste less. And, and as somebody who uh, would, have, would at one point be guilty of consuming more than I needed. Uh, and in the last, I think five, 10 years, I've discovered the incredible advantage of using less. And I think one of the big lessons from the pandemic is how little we actually need for, for, for our survival, how little we actually need to just be happy and comfortable. Um, food waste is a big problem as well. And uh, many of the items that we buy that are packaged food, we don't really consume. You know, have you noticed that expiry date comes along and you just trash it all unthinkingly about how much uh, energy was used in product producing that, packaging it, delivering it to us, and then of course the waste it creates. So these are some of the things that we can all do. Um, and I would also like to include growing more trees. I've uh, replaced giving material gifts to friends and family and colleagues on their birthdays with growing trees in their name. And uh, it's a wonderful practice. I've managed to grow over 8,000 trees in the last year and a half too. And even the receiver feels so good about it. So I think when we just draw our consciousness and our awareness to how we impact the planet and at an individual level, there are many solutions one can find. These are a few. That's, that's actually quite doable. But for my birthday, give me a little tree to plant and a, and a chocolate bar, please. <laughs> I'm just making a silly joke. Bharti Chaturvedi, thanks so much for joining us. So hopefully we can, we can hear you now. Uh, just wanted your opening comments first on you know, the lessons that you think we've learned or hope that people have learned from the pandemic you know, vis-a-vis -vis the environment. And please un unmute your mic. Uh Thanks, thanks, Nidhi. I'm sorry about that earlier glitch. I have terrible internet uh, today. Yes. But um, yeah, what a day to have terrible internet. But um, I think the big lesson for a lot of people, and I think that was learned, was the visual and the stark inequity in terms of um, access to uh, access to very basic resources, whether it's access to clean water, whether it's access to food, whether it was just generally, we could see how how deep uh, for me that was about COVID. Because on one hand, in uh, you saw all these people in the first wave walking home with next to nothing. I mean, they had literally nothing. Uh, everything that they owned was uh, it tied up, and they were you know hauling their little children and walking hundreds of kilometers. But on the other hand, on Instagram and so on you had all these other people putting out photos on of uh, the fabulous food that they were cooking while they were locked down 
and I think that was quite striking the the kind of uh, way that resources uh, and all resources are essentially natural resources or based on natural resources of some kind or the other uh, was so uneven and uh, to me the other big uh, the other big lesson was the experience of COVID because a lot of the elite for example were talking about how clean the air was and that is true you know for example in Delhi one of the most polluted cities in the world we had something like a 15 percent drop in nitrous oxides which is basically fabulous and it all comes from transport so we know that uh, that uh, you know just being locked down uh, improved the air and we saw mountains and you know our pm2 which is a very toxic particulate matter in the air was something like uh, 35 uh, and um, you know that's kind of one quarter of what it is usually so we were all breathing cleaner air but you know from other parts of like Shoni district um, uh, you know, uh, we were hearing reports that uh, village, people who lived in forests were getting uh, getting into more conflicts with wildlife because the forest department, a lot of people had gone on COVID duty. There was no one to warn them that, you know, tigers were prowling around as they typically do. And uh, so there were these conflicts, there were lives lost, poaching doubled. Um, and uh, so, uh, I think uh, inequity for me the, was the big thing, but the other big thing was everybody. We and you know we worked, we worked our twelve hours a day at Chintan, and I think everybody did. Uh, we weren't the only people, of course, um, and everyone worked double because we were all trying to reach out uh, and do uh, you know meaningful ways of doing tangible deep relief. But um, I think for us. Uh, Clearly, it was that we don't need that much because we've kind of almost spent a year now in, uh, you know, 80% of the year in pajamas. And how much do you really need, uh, you know, and globally, uh, globally, that's a big thing. And people who are trying to capitalize on it, in my opinion, uh, quite, uh, you know, with no consideration to the environment, are actually bringing out uh, clothing that's based on this kind of thinking. So for me, inequity in consumption and, uh, you know, therefore environmental injustice was the big uh, fallout of this. Uh, you know, if you look at the waste pickers, and I'll, I'll stop with this uh, on this point, they were the guys who've been going door to door, picking up uh, people's waste throughout and recycling throughout the pandemic. And yet, uh, you know, they're illiterate. They don't have access to registration on for the vaccination, uh, no special benefits were given to them. They weren't considered frontline workers, but at many levels, they were the ones recycling the cardboard and everything else. And at some level, uh, people like them were keeping the cities that we live in going. And yet uh, in many ways that recycling was pretty exploitative um, uh, because of the way that they were so low on both the consumption and the safety uh, hierarchy and so high on the vulnerability hierarchy. That's an excellent point. Uh, thank you so much for those opening comments, uh, Bharti. Uh, I have a question. Uh, Bhairav Pukan is on the panel, uh, uh, one of one of the uh, young participants who has a question. I think Arun can take this question. Bhairav, if you're there, please go ahead. Unmute your mic and video, please. Uh, good evening, uh, everyone. Uh, am I audible? Yes, yes. we can hear you. Uh, my question is to Dia, ma'am. Uh, I wanted to ask that uh, how can uh, the young generation uh, inspire everyone uh, uh, in uh, to protect our planet? Well, Bhairav, I think it starts with individual participation. And yeah. I have to uh, celebrate the fact that uh, in the last one and a half, two years, we have seen an unprecedented rise in youth participation towards environmental um, awareness campaigns and uh, uh, just environment work. And, uh, you know, it is really young communities, children also even, who are leading the, uh, the change at, at an individual level. 
I've met many of these young people. I've also spoken to many of them. So if you go to my Instagram page, you can witness some of these conversations on a chat that I have called Down to Earth with D, where they're leading waste management drives. They're doing tree plantation drives. They are focusing on highlighting, whether it's the Fridays for Future movement. I mean, the kind of work these young people are doing in highlighting and bringing so many times even to my attention um, forests that are being degraded or infrastructure projects that are being, uh, you know, kind of sanctioned. Uh, let's take, for example, draft EIA that was proposed in 2020. Uh, thankfully, because of a very robust representation of young people and over three lakh emails that were sent to uh, the MOAFCC and the government of India, this flawed draft was stalled and hopefully will never go through. Uh, in, in its current form, and they will respond to the points that many people have raised with deep concern and rightfully so. So I think it really starts with young people recognizing the power of their voice and the power of individual action and also mobilizing their efforts through par group participation. I really think that when you connect with more young people, and you connect with young communities, you can make a big change. I think Arun is a wonderful example of, of a movement like that, right? Um, I can think of Afrosha, I can think of uh, Pradeep Sangwan who's healing the Himalayas uh, in his cleanup efforts. There are so many more such young people in the country and the world who are doing exemplary work. All you need to do is align yourself with them and you can make a big change. In fact, Arun, I wanted to ask you about that because you know, you've had this passion particularly for cleaning up our lakes and that, that's something you began at a fairly young age. And have you found over the years uh, more and more young people who are, uh, as Dia says, far more uh, um, alive to this problem uh, and, and willing to sort of just volunteer, not willing, waiting for anyone else to sort of pick up the slack for them? Um, access to information is the biggest trend which brings many young people out onto the field. Uh, 2000, until 2009, we are uh, almost 14 years old now as an organization. 2007 to 2009 or even mid-2010, it was a different scenario. I'm speaking from personal capacity. Uh, before when we had access to many of the social media or the evolved social media, there was a lot more action on field. Today, we see a lot more action on the virtual world because we believe that by sharing a poster of that tiger or liking the picture of the river, we have done our bit for the river and the tiger. I desperately seek for people to be out there on the field to do things hands-on. Example, in one particular social media platform where you create an event and it could be a beach cleanup, weekend beach cleanup, a, a, a plantation maintenance drive, you would see thousand people virtually going. On reality, that will translate to probably 10. And that is where the gap is. The whole, uh, the whole concept of young people, putting this trust on young people, I think young people need a lot of guidance. And they need to be told that, look, things have to be done on field. We can't just speak about it. And it's a wonderful journey to be part of environment conservation. Once you just involve yourself, I'm a Telugu speaking guy living in Chennai and my Hindi is broken. And the only reason why I got to know Hindi was because I studied in Delhi. But that travel didn't give me the exposure that I have today. It's the lake in Bhuj, the lake in uh, Srinagar, or that particular water body outside of Shillong. We've been to 20 different states in this country where we've had the opportunity to work on water bodies. And often I get asked this one question, which state's lake is the dirtiest Arun? I tell them only one thing. The one thing that which unites us as a country is not religion, language, food, culture. It's our ability to abuse nature. Uh, whether it's Meghalaya, Lakshadweep, or Tamil Nadu, Kerala, we just take our lakes and ponds for granted. And, and when I look at the energy in the young people in all these states, right, it's one. They all want to do something. If I handed over a piece of paper and a pencil and asked them to draw something about nature, they will draw a stream, they will draw a coconut tree, they'll draw a V-shaped bird, they'll put a tri tiny little triangle as a home under that coconut tree. And then we ask them a bunch of questions. What do you want to do? They all want to protect elephants, tigers, forests, lakes, rivers, ponds. But they're caught in the social web of peer pressure and so much 
of stereotype uh, typical thinking that they're not able to break that chain just explore evolve what environment work can do to young people is give them an opportunity to explore thereby evolve and thereby experience a whole new india a happy positive india that's my invite to any young person who's watching who wants to do something in on the field not in the virtual world in fact uh, what you just said uh, is, is it's a good lead into anjali shriram who has a question uh, which in a way is related to this anjali if you're there please unmute your mic and go ahead with your question yeah am i audible yes we can hear you yeah so my question was actually related to that is that yeah. we are taught the uh, environmental studies in school but it is a subject that's forced upon us like nobody really attends the subject and it's all it's like a game period for everyone so and if education is about environmental like knowledge it's so important and we should be starting that in school itself like in the 10 years of my school i think we barely had like one or two uh, tree plantation you know things right. so how do you think this can be implemented at a school sure. level let, let me take uh, okay dia dia wants to answer that and then bharti also please dia please go ahead i, I could be answer something that i've learned from my experience working with the sanctuary nature foundation and the kids for tigers program right we believe in the power of engagement and taking young people we actually through wildlife trust of india even take ceos to the forest now the power of taking people to the forest or taking so in mumbai we go for these nature trails or walks to the sanjay gandhi national park or we go to the uh, suri creek so that children interact with nature engage with nature and therefore understand the power of nature and fall in love with nature and then want to protect it um it's 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 something that baba diem said right in the end you will only protect that what you love and you will only learn uh love what you learn about and learning is not possible theoretically just like arun said yes there's a lot that can be done online or through just textbook education and unfortunately many young people seem to be disconnected from nature therefore they are disconnected from the subject when you interact with nature uh, and nidhi there's a powerful book that i hope every parent in this country reads um called um last child in the woods and it talks about something called a nature deficit which uh, leads to this disconnect that people have and and the health and the psychological uh, uh, you know effects that this has on people as we grow up but the only way we can transform our societies is to encourage uh, eco literacy we have to learn about ecosystems and nature and we have to do it through interacting with nature so even if it is something as simple as encouraging parents to plant trees at home in pots if they must and encourage their children to participate and watch something grow you know just the miracle of watching that life emerge can make a big difference and then take it the next step and the next step uh, but even the waste management nidhi when we see children in the drives right when we are doing beach cleanups or we are doing river or mangrove cleanups you know the way children respond to packaging after they've been on a cleanup is so different to a child who mindlessly and thoughtlessly asks for packaged food their relationship with the plastic the chips packet or the biscuit packet or the chocolate packet changes and yeah. i think that is what is missing and and the more we engage at a at a physical level the bigger the difference we make in fact i've noticed bharti chaturvedi on this point of how to sort of encourage kids and make them more environmentally conscious my 6 year old niece uh is uh you know she was she was encouraged to sort of plant a little sapling they've been encouraged to plant trees she keeps pointing out to my brother that he must switch off the lights and things like that and he feels very guilty <laughs> because she's telling him to do that so you know what dia says is right because kids do absorb so much and yet our school curriculum makes it as anjali shriram rightly said it makes it you know such a passing sort of a boring uh, you know subject I, i mean till a few years ago climate change and and uh you know issues related to the environment didn't even make it to the front page of newspapers and i know this having been in the media thankfully perhaps the air emergency in delhi to begin with 
made us, you know, sort of change the headlines. How do we change this at, at the school level to begin with, in your view? Uh, well, firstly, I, uh, you know, our, um, first of all, it's, of course, as Dia, Dia said about the exposure, but not every, every school is equal, you know, not every school can, has the ability to take kids out or participate in programs. There are schools with barely nothing. And I think uh, we have to invest also in, in uh, getting, you know, making our cities or, uh, and I won't talk of rural India because that's kind of quite a different landscape, but our cities are increasingly, you know, barren and concretized. I mean, you look at Gurgaon, it's, there's no where you have to go to a biodiversity park in order to actually experience vegetation outside of, you know, the few potted plants you have, it's just not the same thing. And so I, I really think, first of all, uh, we really need to look at community level greening, not of, you know, uh, whether, and it's not just trees, it's, it's grasses. I mean, many of our ecosystems are not tree uh, uh, ecosystems. And it's quite terrible that we plant all of this, say, in Rajasthan, but they're beautiful grasslands. I think the other, the other really, uh, the other interesting thing I find is uh, we run a program for internships. And pretty much we take all kinds of people. Uh, we take volunteers who are quite young, as young as, you know, 13 and 14, and we put them out there, not totally because they have limited time, they have school and older kids as well, uh, and college going kids, masters, people. And that experience of looking at how stark, uh, starkly contrasting many of their worlds are, because many of them live in you know, pretty decent middle-class uh, localities across the country. You know, they'll have at least a park and the park might have a tree. But when you actually go to lesser served areas and you say, oh my God, 40% of the city looks like this. We've got to, we've got to change that. And uh, the, a lot of my colleagues have actually moved on and started looking at greening uh, startups, which I find very gratifying and I enjoy supporting them. You know, plant cart, for example, I mean, uh, who would imagine that this would be the way you try to change the, the world? So I believe that uh, there's no replacement for experiential, but I do believe that you do need to still read up because otherwise you're going to tout these semi-solutions if, if you don't have a sense of the data and the science, mm -hmm. but they, really there is no option. But given that not every kid can, you know, go out and you see, you see kids where, families and a lot of families are just working families uh, uh, you know they, they don't they can't invest that kind of uh, oversight in their kids going picking picking them up all of that doesn't happen uh, to a lot of um, you know even middle class kids uh, we find uh, that they're unable to do that so for the, I just believe if our own uh, immediate landscapes were more beautiful I mean if anyone's uh, watched how much we talk about the Amal Tas tree and how much that helps us connect, not just with nature, but in the last one month about the importance of, uh, of conserving even a, a tree that doesn't take a lot of space and takes very little water, by the way. Uh, you know, so I think even some, an exposure to something like that um, is important. And unfortunately, in a lot of our cities today, we are living on the dregs of previous, uh, previous plantations and previous green good deeds because uh, that's pretty much being eroded and our cities are turning into pretty sad, bare uh, looking spaces. You know, the grasslands have gone, all of that. So we should bring that back as well because that's the biggest form of exposure. Personally, I used to wander around in the empty plots near my house uh, trying to make sense of what birds I was seeing. And that's how I got interested in all of this. Right, but that's quite that is quite interesting and and quite true. Perhaps in uh, in in the Delhi NCR region, we still have an opportunity to to do some of that in Mumbai and you know cities like that. It's so much harder, uh, although it still can be done. Uh, is Sakshi Agarwal here? Sakshi, you have your question. Uh, hey, Nidhi. Yes. Um, Go ahead, Sakshi. Yeah, sure. So being an economic student, uh, students have begun to believe that voluntary participation in such drives is not sustainable. We need to create economic incentives for participation in such things to sustain. I want to understand why 
given that there is a growing consciousness, there isn't a good amount of corporate investment uh, towards nipping the problem at the bud, in the bud. Okay, you all right. More, you mean more involvement of of the corporate world in uh, in the environment uh, on environment issues. For example, Arun, do you want to take that question, Arun Krishnamurti? Is there a way to incentivize? I mean, they're already doing CSR and all, but is there a way you think that uh, you can get corporates more involved in this sector? Actually, India's uh, businesses, India's industries, not all of them, but many of them are involved in a big way. For example, an organization like EFI, all the 141 projects that we've done is not through public funds. It's not through government funds. It's through CSR uh, initiatives only. I can't name any of them on this panel for the right reasons, but I would request the uh, individual who asked this question to read about our projects where you'll see that uh, the government has made it a mandate for big businesses to spend 2% of their profit on CSR projects. Including during the pandemic, there are investments from such industries, corporates, uh, which is actually coming into the system. So that's happening at one level. And why do we require these volunteer driven movements? See, volunteer driven movements are part of the larger solution. It's probably 5% of the larger solution. 95%, just take a lake, for example, the Makarba Lake in Ahmedabad, which we restored. We, we clogged anywhere between 360 to 420 hours of volunteer hours in that lake. But then the mechanized work, the technology-based solutions that we had to induce into that particular lake for restoration took us almost uh, a good eight and a half months. So when you look at the money, the resources that have been invested into that lake restoration on whole, 5% of it was for volunteer engagement. Why is volunteer engagement important? Because if somebody is just going to walk into a water body and revive it, restore it through mechanized means, and then just hand it over to the community, there is, there is no identity to that project. When a handful of volunteers participate, that 95% of the mechanized work gets pushed behind. It looks like that 5% of the volunteers were the one who hand dug that lake, who, who put up those embankments, who put up those fence, which, which brings a sense of pride, which brings a sense of uh, ownership in that project. So to bring in that ownership is why volunteerism is important. India's businesses can do a lot more, no denying that. Currently, based on government mandate, there is a program where they're all investing into several social entrepreneurial ventures, including that of EFI. So it's happening, it can, it, it can expand a lot more. I have a question uh, uh, before I come to the so next- I want to add to this before- you Sure, sure Dia. Because I think she's asked a very important question. Uh, I also am very excited about the fact that she's, um, you know, an economist, uh, a student of e uh, economics, because uh, there's one thing that Robert Kennedy had said, which uh, in his own language, even the man that led the Chipko movement in India, uh, Bhagunaji had said, which is the economy is a wholly owned subsidiary of the environment. And there is enough now evidence uh, by leading economists that we cannot continue to plunder uh, ecology and expect to grow as economies. So unfortunately, up until a few years ago, environmentalism was perceived as obstructionism. It's finally and evidentially um, now accessible to students, of course, of economies and the, the capitalists of the world that the only way we can truly survive the threats, the living threats that our planet is facing and human beings are, are facing is by changing the way we run our economies and how we interpret our relationship with nature. There's a very important statistic that has come in, um, which ecosystem restoration, which is of course the theme of this year and this decade is, has come in, that um, with every $1 spent bringing, sorry, in ecosystem restoration, which, which is a winning investment with every $1 spent, the return on that $1 for ecosystem restoration will be 10 to $15. And uh, smart restoration plans will be the key to uh, build back greener from COVID-19. And there are huge funds now globally that are focusing on greening economies. And this is an area that we all as young people, especially, need to understand better and as economists need to understand better.
in fact related to that bharti chaturvedi you know my question was that you know when we talk about development is that possible without destroying our bi biodiversity and our environment or are these false binaries that you know are are created i think dia has partly answered that because uh, i'm sure there's a way to develop our economies while thinking of your ecology and and your environment oh yeah absolutely and um, i want to kind of uh, take a step back uh, to that question i found that really interesting and i my understanding is that there is there is um, and actually i really admire what arun's doing arun i've never had a chance to chat with you but i hope uh, this will be a turning point and i will later it's such fab work and but what what i what i want to say is that um, is that uh, the 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 corporates and business per se there are two big thoughts here you know if you're talking um, about planetary uh, you know limitations one of them is that the way business is done has to change you know no matter how much money you put in through csr or through the goodness of your heart or whatever it is if you go on if your manufacturing or your business logic beyond manufacturing uh, doesn't change uh, then you don't really create that paradigm shift so if you're going to create if you're going to manufacture all these kinds of chemicals for example or or clothing which uh, harms the world or whatever it is of your business logic is very energy intensive and it's linked with you know um, those kinds of uh, processes then i think csr is important uh, in what it does and it has its own logic but we're really not shifting the paradigm and we're not going to be able to reconcile these and the way that we have to reconcile them and which is the second point is really a moving to a circular economy and circular economy is not recycling recycling is not the answer uh, i mean and i'm saying this very mindful of the fact that how hundreds of thousands of people all over the world and in fact even in india depend uh, and these are poor people depend on recycling i work with uh, thousands of them as well but um, this is this we need that paradigm shift and the only way that um, that that will happen is if business logic moves for example to sharing economies if it moves to a reuse economy and not just tiny things and startups which have their own place because these are always um, these are always important but also at a scale and that's why i believe that you uh, that that is where the future of business lies and that brings me to the point can business can big business and uh, you know ever really be sustainable in that sense and if we do want to be sustainable we have to start circulating materials which means planned obsolescence has to go out of uh, you know go out of the window you just should not have to you know have different chargers for every cell phone your charger should last across the the years and across the models and the brands and similarly uh, what you put into your cell phone why why do we have cell phones that you just can't that go so slow after a couple of years similarly um, how do how do you design materials that they don't uh, that you know you can uh, modularly take them apart and reuse them so we need a complete shift and there are lots and lots of jobs there whether we're looking at electric vehicles um, which is kind of if if it goes into buses then it is about the sharing economy and there are huge numbers of jobs there and there's a whole business opportunity there so that's just yeah. one example but i just wanted to underline that yeah uh, uh, shivani are you here shivani ingole has a question shivani if you are there please go ahead just unmute your mic shivani if you're there uh hello can you hear me yes go ahead shivani uh yeah actually ma'am my question is uh, we're talking about the pandemic before some time so after the pandemic what i think there would be a huge problem of uh, garbage from hospitals you know mask and uh, other plastics we are already facing the problem of plastic in our country and after the pandemic uh, what will be uh, the consequences of this uh, plastic uh, uh, and what will it affect on climate change how how it will affect on climate change good question arun do you want to take that because you did raise that while you know you were talking about the clean up drives that you do and how you're coming across you know this this kind of stuff wherever you go 
I want to come across correct when I answer this question. No denying the fact that our medical frontline workers need that level of protection when they're trying to help us through this pandemic, nor the fact that we all have to wear masks. All of that's utmost important. But the amount of medical waste that gets generated in the process, not after the pandemic, even during the pandemic, is appalling. And uh, when we look at big cities, mega cities, Chennai, Bangalore, Hyderabad, Bombay, Kolkata, Delhi, these cities have certain incinerators which again add a negative impact on environment where medical waste cannot be recycled, it can only be burned. And at least these cities have that infrastructure. Think about tier two, tier three cities where this is actually accumulating in the so-called landfills, which are just dumping sites where we are carrying forward all this medical waste and putting it out. Now, what we're doing is in the event, that's where we come to an extremely human centric world. In the event of a pandemic where we're trying to protect ourselves, we are creating a futuristic problem in the name of all these one time use and throw uh, uh, materials ranging from gloves, masks. Again, I repeat, definitely, yes, we have to use it. But are there alternatives for it? But who's going to buy the argument of alternative, reusable, washable material at this time? That's where we are going wrong again and again. 2015, when the Chennai floods happened, I thought all of us would only talk about the Chennai lakes and ponds, which we did until February of 2016. There were multiple things which happened after which, ranging from politics, movies, to things which otherwise capture our imagination, that the environment and the lakes and the ponds eroded from our memory as early as February of 2016. That's the same with the pandemic. We don't have a sustained thought for the planet, which is where we're going wrong. With regards to this medical waste, it is an impending threat and it is building up now. And we don't know what kind of medical impacts it will have back on us. And that's where we all have to be cautious at an individual level, because as a society, as a community, I'm not sure if we can change the usage pattern today. But at an individual level, if we take on this responsibility of me using only washable masks and me being extra careful not to use gloves, etc., which I don't need at a certain point. And if I can convince three others, five others in my life, that is the only immediate solution that I can actually think about. Right. Uh, is Vaseem there? Vaseem, you have a question for the panelists. Please go ahead, Vaseem. Good evening, everyone. My question is to Dia Ma'am. Ma'am, since you advocated uh, taking more plant-based diet, um, do you think veganism is only for the rich, the elite, and the privileged? In a country like ours, with, with all its inequities, when people are um, struggling to make their ends meet, how possible it is for common people to go for vegan options? Okay. Yeah. It, it is... Uh, <laughs> it's interesting that you ask this question. But uh, from what I understand... It is people uh, who cannot afford um, uh, other diets, who, who actually very eff effortlessly practice uh, plant-based diets. And uh, I, I didn't say veganism. I said plant-based because uh, there are many, many, many people who can and comfortably eat, uh, whether it is a basic pulse or a basic or, or of course, plant, uh, vegetables, um, and uh, it's uh, it's. I think it's a misnomer to imagine or assume that uh, it's it's an expensive or a difficult uh, choice to make. It's not. It's in fact the very opposite. When I encourage people to eat local and eat seasonal, uh, that includes uh, the fact that when something is seasonal and it is local, it is generally more affordable than eating imported or, uh, you know, foods that are inaccessible to a larger community of people. And I'm sure Bharti will be able to, uh, you know, elaborate on this much more. Um, I, uh, I would like, I, I do believe that uh, the, the staple meal that most people eat in our country is vegetarian and is plant-based. Okay, uh, Justin, are you there? Justin, you have a question? Because I'd like to take, uh, since we have the last five, seven minutes, I'd like to take as many questions as we can. Yes, Justin. Am I, am I audible? Yes, we can hear you. Yeah, so I just had a question with respect to, uh, like it's just open to the panel. 
So, uh, do you face any regulatory issues with respect to organizing these kinds of uh, eco drives, say, in particular, uh, say, afforestation drives or lake cleanup drives? Or is it just is it just as easy as just pulling up your socks and going out and just doing it? Like, what do, what does it take? What is the minimum requirement to organize such a event? Arun, go ahead, take that question. India has wonderful set of bureaucrats. Uh, probably yes, not all of them. I don't know. There are some brilliant officers who have actually given their exams to be there to do something for the country. They are caught up in the system and they are waiting for people like you and me to just walk up to their door and then tell them, listen, we want to work with you. Can we go do this? One officer once told me, uh, you don't need permission to dump garbage in this country, but you need permission to clean up that garbage from that lake. So then he sent me to a bunch of officers. He said, get a letter from the police, get a letter from the fire department. And then he said, this is the system. So in some places, yes, in most places, you actually, do, you need to just inform the authority. See, we can't do things on our own by breaking the law of the land. We definitely have to stick to everything that we do uh, based on the rules, regulations here, and it, things will fall in place. Don't worry. Just be patient, perceive it, and build a strong relationship with authorities, local authorities. There's no money involved in it. You just need to have that friendly relationship association. Get to know who your ward councillor is. Get to know who your zone officer is in that municipality, corporation, panchayat, or to which particular government department that natural habitat belongs. Public works department, forest department, who check on the rules, regulations, tell them we voluntarily want to clean this up. We don't have commercial interest. And they immediately do let you do the work. So, and don't worry about it's government's job. Don't listen to people who are going to come and tell you, this is government's job. Why are you doing it? Uh, either ask them to participate or not to disturb you. That's the only message. I think that's good practical advice. Bharti Chaturvedi, you, you had an intervention you wanted to make. Please go ahead. Yeah, I did actually. Uh, by the way, I, before that, I just want to give a big thumbs up to Arun, I think that's exactly it. Know your local councillor, bully your MLA. The MLA shouldn't be bullying you. You should be bullying them. Um, but, uh, you know, just to pick up from what Dia said, and I think I'm so grateful that Dia, that you talked about seasonal uh, because, uh, you know, we really don't have to have bhindi in the middle of the winter just because we like it. And there is a logic to that. But, um, but also, I, I just wanted to offer everybody, and that's beyond just food, an analogy with the whole idea of climate justice when we talk of food. So in India, we often say that, look, uh, we aren't even a developed country and we still have a long way to go. And, uh, you know, we have to fight poverty. And so that growth, no matter how green it is, it will have emissions. So it, we keep saying that the, the developed world has to take itself away from and clear the carbon space so that there is that space in which we can uh, add some emissions without actually uh, you know, contributing to climate change. So we say you tighten your belts so that we can grow. And similarly, I think when we're talking about food, I think it's very important that people who can afford it go to a plant-based diet. Um, uh, unfortunately, I think- Because we know that many, you know, uh, you know, really certain kinds of meat are the only nutrition that we ever get, the only proteins, because, you know, dal is too expensive and it's not even first grade meat that we eat. Um, you know, it's not even high quality. So I think uh, people like us, many of us on this panel and our families and the people we hang out with, we have to tighten our, our greenhouse gas emission belts uh, by saying, doing a plant-based diet and all of those kinds of things so that other people actually can get enough nutrition. And uh, of course, eating locally is absolutely and seasonally is absolutely non-negotiable in my point of view. I see no reason why people in Delhi, uh, you know, are getting completely obsessed with avocados, for example, you know, that's, that's uh, let that be a rare meat. So that's my limited point. I was thinking of avocados for the exact same reason. Uh, yeah, Ishan, Ishan <laughs> you are there. go ahead with the question. Yes. A very good evening, everyone. My question to the panelists is that uh, water conservation should be the most important issue as of now. Uh, recently, a report I read in newspaper that 93% of the water samples throughout the countries failed as it contains more of uranium levels uh, more than required. So uh, why is government not serious for uh, uh, water conservation and why is it not serious for sustainable development when it knows that money is 
no more important than the basic necessities of life okay arun yes you had your hand raised you're the right person to you ask that question you know we are the one country where we have maximum number of bore wells in the world where everybody could just dig underground and suck as much water as they want we don't pay for our sewage we don't pay for our water and when you talk about people paying for water it's such a big political issue again equity equal distribution water is a human right and all of this comes into place yes i'm mentioning all of this with regards to governance water management in this country is at a flawed mandate simply because it's vote bank politics right and around water we've seen interstate if states could go to war i'm sure multiple states in this country would just wage war on each other simply based on water that is where we stand as a country we don't have water literacy our fellow panelists were speaking about um education uh, ecological literacy environment literacy water literacy is zero water at the end of an open tap yes we are happy if there's no water at the end of the tap there's a drought no it's because government didn't give us water when there's too much water it's because government opened the dams to the gate again the point is we don't have an association with water where is your drinking water coming from how much water are you consuming day in and day out and how much water are you sucking from the ground below how much are you replenishing that source with are you capable of rep- i'm i'm not speaking to that individual i'm i'm assuming i'm talking to a mirror and asking myself am i replenishing that ground source from where i'm tapping that water and what all am i using my water for the detergents the shampoos the soaps everything that i use the water that i get into my home and the water that i send out of my home all of this needs to have a holistic approach to it again i don't have a solution from the government side because i'm not the government i'm talking as a citizen of india and as citizen of india my role begins and ends with what i can do at my household can i not use all these artificial chemical loaded toiletries can i look at natural products so that that water can actually feed the ground and some vegetation within the property where i live which can feed on that nutrition how much water am i using for what purpose and how do i go about it i would love to have a detailed conversation with you on this much later because i don't want to take the time of the panel but water literacy is what's going to help us save the water problem in india i have time for one last question Doc- dr sandesh yadav if you're there please go ahead uh yeah yes, sir uh, am i audible yes please go ahead uh first of all i would like to greet you all that you uh, guys are over here and talking about some sensible sort of a thing regarding the climate change uh one important point what i want to make here is that because i keep on attending the webinars related to climate change and climate change is my expertise so till now what i have observed that intellectual section of our society means all all professors uh, are working to show their work so that what they are doing but they are least interested in developing a pathway to mitigate the climate change our is a developing country our scenario is different from the developed countries so what is happening in india is that we have to deal at various stages at the national state district and then sub at the village level now what is happening that climate change is altering the agricultural production climate change is also what affecting is the yadav what is your question so my question is that can you just raise this single point that if anyone is working for the climate change then can we develop a pathway to mitigate a climate change in context of india with a special reference to india that's okay. it okay so uh, let me let let dia take this this last question uh, that do you think dia as a country as a government we have a we re, we have an actual plan to deal with these issues do we know what we're doing um well in silos right and i think that's actually a very big part of the problem and uh, can and, and just connecting intergovernmental agencies and helping them just engage with one another more can bring about a huge shift in the way we're going about uh, whether it is building infrastructure or doing many other things uh, i discovered on another panel today and it really blew my mind the fact that health doesn't feature as a law in anywhere in our country it's not something that is given importance to 
So we have environmental laws, we have light, wildlife protection laws, we have water laws, we have all these laws, but health is not a part of it. And, and I think that really is evidence of the fact that when we, are, we even when we form policy and we're drafting laws, we're not connecting the environment and nature with health and progress and economic progress. Um, so I would hope that moving forward, if there is one thing that we've learned through this extraordinary human crisis is the fact that we cannot be ill afford working in silos. We have to communicate, engage and work with each other. And government agencies especially have to start engaging with one another. Because like Arun pointed out, there are many good bureaucrats in the country who are doing a lot of good work. But their work comes to no good eventually because there will be one other agency in another part of government that will undo the good work that one has done. So they need to start working with each other. Interestingly enough, Nidhi, two years ago, UNEP organized this meeting of different intergovernmental agencies that work in forest and climate change and environment. And that was the first time these agencies we're sitting together at a table. Wow, that says a lot. Yeah. That says a lot. Well, we're completely out of time. Uh, thank you so much to all of you, to Dia Mirza, Arun Krishnamurti, and Bharti Chaturvedi for joining us to talk about these important issues. Thank you to our participants. And thank you to, to our guests tonight for all the good work you guys are doing in your own way uh, and contributing to, to saving the environment because you, you guys are the ones who are actually taking this beyond uh, just conversations that, that people have and, and doing something on the ground. So thank you for that. And uh, once again, to remind everybody, we have a deadline uh, of the 15th of July for our applications to the Masters uh, in Public Policy Program at Cotillia. So please do apply. This is your last chance to do that. Thanks so much once again. Good night.